Are you trying to figure out how to write code for your Arduino project? Maybe you've got an idea of how you want the program to work, but you're sort of having a hard time visualizing how everything's going to actually work together. And maybe the coding feels a little bit more like a random walk than a, I don't know, a straightforward process. This is actually a pretty common problem for Arduino developers, but there's this really useful tool that can help you visualize how all your code is going to flow together. It's called a state diagram. And I'm telling you, once you've made one of these things, you are going to be hooked. My name is Mike Chach. I'm the owner of Programming Electronics Academy and the author of the Arduino book for beginners. All right, let's go. So what's a state diagram? Well, a state diagram is a visual tool that's used by software developers like you and I and other stakeholders to help design a program. So you can kind of think of a program as a system of states where a state represents a snapshot of the entire system at a given time. So let's just say we made a state diagram of cleaning a car. It might look something like this. We could have a state that says get supplies, a state that says wash cars, and then a state that says enjoy clean car. Now, I don't know why I picked this example because I have the kind of car that people walk by and they write on the back, please clean me. But anyway, so basically each one of these boxes represents a state and each state has entry and exit criteria. For example, the wash car state entry criteria is that all of the items have been collected from the get supply state. So once this is met, then we enter into the wash car state. The exit condition for the wash car state says, hey, does it appear to be clean? If it appears to be clean, then we move into the enjoy clean car state. However, if the car still looks dirty, we can re-enter the wash car state and it would continue that cycle until you get to an exit criteria where the car appears clean and then you could again move on. So there can be multiple entry and exit criteria for each state, but the idea is that they are all clearly defined. Now let's say I went out and I took an actual picture of the wash car state. The picture might include things like a hose running with water shooting out, a bucket full of soapy water, and suds on a car. These things represent the state of affairs in that given state, okay? We could call those state variables. The values in those state variables during the enjoy clean car state are gonna be different from the values of those same variables in the wash car state. Some of the things may be the same. For example, both states will still have a car, but in one of them, namely the wash car state, the car is going to have suds on it and the other one, there won't be any suds. So hopefully you kind of get the basic idea here. Now I want to say, I'm sure there's a more right way to create a state diagram than what I'm showing you here, but I think that this really points in the right direction and I have found it extremely useful. Now I'm working on a guide that's going to help you craft your own state diagrams, plus an entire process for prototyping your Arduino projects that's going to help you get the great ideas out of your head and actually manifest them into reality. Now if you want to get early access to that guide, just click the link below or you can scan this QR code right here. So let's just say this again about state diagrams. A state diagram is a visual way to help developers like you describe the flow of a program discuss the program with others, and think about the system as a whole. Now, what's just important is what a state diagram is not. So it's really important to note that a state diagram does not map one-to-one -to, -one to the actual code or any specific functions in the code. Now, there may be some overlap, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but really, a state diagram is an abstraction. It tells me about the system at a level of detail that's meaningful for thinking about it and conversing about how the program functions as a whole, but not necessarily in its minute detail. So when we are talking about how the code is actually written, like what functions are used, what code structures, then we're talking about its implementation. So there can be many different ways to implement a program that can conform to the same state diagram. You know, maybe we use like global variables or maybe you use a bunch of pointers or maybe you use switch case statements or for loops or whatever those little details are on how it actually gets coded. That is called the implementation. So a state diagram can and will help a programmer think about the implementation, but it does not tell a programmer how to implement the program. 
If we go back to our car washing state diagram, when we see the state get supplies, it tells us what we're doing. I could tell my daughter, hey, go get supplies to wash a car. She generally know what I expect from her. How she does that, you know, maybe she searches the garage, maybe she asks some neighbors for stuff, maybe she buys supplies from a local auto store, that's her implementation. Now, sometimes you'll find a developer that uses state names in the implementation of different function names or structures. So this isn't necessary per se, but the practice is perfectly fine and it can help kind of ease the cognitive load of going from a state diagram to actual code implementation. And you'll find when you look at the implementation I made from the state diagram that I indeed tried to borrow some of the terminology from the state diagram into the functions that I made in the program. Okay. So now we're going to switch to the second part of this video where I'm going to talk about a specific state diagram that I created for a ChatGPT project that allows an ESP32 to talk with OpenAI through their API. Now, just a reminder, if you want to get early access to that guide that I'm working on, that's going to show you exactly how to craft these state diagrams for your project. And I'm also going to give you some worksheets to help supercharge your prototyping process so that you can bridge the gap between your ideas and actually bringing a project to life. If you want to get on the wait list for that, make sure to click the link in the description, or you can get on the wait list at this QR code right here. The JLC PCB Black Friday sale is now live. Every user can get up to $650 in coupons to spend on PCBs, 3D printing, CNC machining, mechatronic parts, stencils, and all your project needs. Unlock your savings at JLC PCB, your one-stop manufacturing platform. Click the link below to start saving. Okay, so now that we've covered what the basics of a state diagram is and isn't, what I want to do now is talk specifically about the different states that are mapped out in this ChatGPT terminal project. So here is the ChatGPT Twino state diagram. You'll see there's six different states in this diagram. What I want to do is kind of talk generally about each one. So the first one is get user input. And this is actually the default state that the program starts in. And what happens here is that every key press that comes from the keyboard is evaluated in this state. And what we're trying to do is figure out, is it a character key or a command key? If it's a character key, then the system saves that character to an appropriate message. And if it's a command key, then it's either going to respond directly to the command by adjusting the message. For example, let's say somebody pressed backspace, then that would remove the last character from the current message. Or if it's a command key like enter, it might change the state entirely. Now you can see from the get user input state, there's lots of different ways to leave this state. In fact, there's four different ways that we leave this state, all based on different key presses. So if a character key is pressed, and every time a character key is pressed, after that character key is saved the appropriate message, then it goes to another state, the display input state. And in the display input state, the system displays the user's input on the OLED. So every time a character key is pressed, you enter this state and the display is updated. So if you type the letter J, a letter J shows up on the OLED. If you type the letter O, then the O gets added. So you'd see J-O. So you can see this state automatically returns to get user input after it has displayed its text to the OLED. So that brings us back to get user input. Now, another way to leave get user input is if you press the escape key. When you press the escape key, it takes you to the update system message key. Now, we talked previously a little bit about the system message. It's that message that can be used to steer the response from the ChatGPT API. And when you enter this update system message, what happens is the character keys that are pressed start being recorded to the system message instead of the user message. Now, once the user submits a new system message, they press enter and the enter key is what brings them back to get user input. Another way to leave the get user input state is to press the enter button while you're in the get user input state. So notice that different key presses have different effects depending on what state you're in. If I'm in the update system message state, when I press enter, that's going to take me back to get user input state. If I'm in the get user input state and I press enter, it takes me to get response. So we can use that same key mapping, 
but for different actions based on what state we're in. So let's go down that route. Let's see, I'm in get user input. I've just typed in a message to ChatGPT like, which side should I butter my bread? And I press enter. That is going to take me to the get response state. And what happens in the get response state is that all of the messages between the user, the assistant, and the system message are formed into a JSON packet. They are sent to the OpenAI ChatGPT API with a post request. And then when the response comes back, the JSON is parsed and the appropriate part of the response is saved to a message. Now, if the response comes back successfully, then we move on to the display response state. But if the response fails to come back for some reason, maybe the OpenAI server is not responding or it timed out, or perhaps it was a malformed JSON request or something like that, then what happens is it re-enters its own state and attempts again. But let's just say that we have a response success. We would move on to display response. What the system does here is display the response that was just received from the ChatGPT API to the OLED. So let's say I asked it, uh, which side do I butter my bread? And it comes back and it says, you butter the top side, of course. That message right there, you butter the top side, of course, that is what is gonna be shown on the OLED. Now, after you've displayed the response, we immediately go back to the get user input state. Now, while you're in the get user input state, before you've pressed any other keys, the OLED is still displaying the previous message that was returned from the API. So in this case, it would have been, you butter the top side immediately. But let's say that it was a longer message. If the message is long, what happens during the display response phase is that the message will come word by word. It'll fill up the whole OLED. There's like four lines that get displayed. And then when the next word comes in, it will scroll the text up. And so you keep seeing new text kind of pop in and scroll up. So if you get to get user input and you want to read the beginning of the message, you have to enter a new state. To do that, you would just press the up or down arrow. When you do that, you're brought to the review response state. And in this state, it does essentially that. It just moves the display text on the OLED. It either moves it up or down depending on what button you press. After you press the up arrow once or the down arrow once, you're immediately brought back to the get user input state. Now, if you press the up arrow again, you're gonna, again, you're gonna go through that circle just over and over and over, you know, as you go up or go down. So as you can probably tell, the system spends a lot of time in the get user input state. It's the default starting place of the system, and it's kind of the center of gravity for all of the other states. In fact, the only state that does not directly go back to the get user input state is the get response state. So now what I want to do is just recap this diagram in a nutshell, okay? So we start off in get user input and we're going to evaluate keyboard presses. If it's a character key, we're going to jump into the display input state, display it, and then immediately come back to get user input. If it's a command key, depending on what that command key is, we will take that action. For example, if it's backspace, we'll move back. But if we're in the get user input state and we press escape, then we're gonna come down to update system message. Now, when we're here, any character key that comes in is going to get saved into the system message instead of the user input message. And if we're in this state and we press enter, that's gonna take us back to the get user input state. Now, if we're in the get user input state and we press enter, let's say we finished our message, that's gonna take us to get response. Get response is gonna take all of the messages that have been recorded so far, so from the user, from the assistant, and also that system message, it's gonna bundle them up into a JSON packet. It's gonna send a post request to the OpenAI ChatGPT API. It's gonna get the response back, parse it, and save that response. So there's a lot of stuff going on in get response. If it fails for some reason, it's just gonna try it again right from the top of get response. If it succeeds though, then it moves out of that state, goes into display response, and that's when you just display it on the OLED. Once it's been successfully displayed, we come back to get user input, and then the user at that time has the option to press the up and down arrows, which will take them to review response, and which will adjust what is shown on the OLED. And that's pretty much the system in a nutshell. 
Now, if you're still here, you might be wondering about this ChatGPTino project. It's actually one of several projects that we build at Programming Electronics Academy. If you want to learn more about our training, you can check out ProgrammingElectronics.com. That's ProgrammingElectronics.com. Now, the next video you should watch is this one right here. It's about three tips I wish I would have known when I started working with Arduino. This video right here, three great tips.